Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Psalms chapter 149, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 4. And this is what it says. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and His praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in His Maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their King. Let them praise His name with dancing. Let them sing praises to Him with the timbrel and the lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. I like that. The Lord takes pleasure in His people. You might not have realized that. Verse 4 says, the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Pray with me. Lord, You take pleasure in Your people, so You choose to be here. And may our heart, may our hearts be, be thankful give you honor, give you praise. May we never take it for granted. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Max Lucado told a story about a little songbird named Chippy. Chippy was a happy bird and he sang all day long. He sat there on his perch until one day his owner was cleaning out the bottom of his cage. She had the, the hose for the vacuum cleaner in the bottom of his cage when the phone rang. She turned to just look at the phone. That's all it took. And she heard, and Chippy was gone. Down the hose into the dirt bag. She turned off the vacuum very quickly and tore into the dirt bag, and there was little Chippy. He was still alive, so she, she rushed him over to the faucet. She turned it on full blast, and the more she scrubbed, the worse Chippy looked. So she pulled out a hair dryer, and she began to blow off Chippy. Well, feathers went everywhere. She did the best she could. She put Chippy back in his cage, and a couple of days later, a friend called and asked her, how's Chippy doing? She said, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> Maybe you've been there before. Sitting on your perch, life was good. Singing away and all of a sudden, life just sucked the song right out of you. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there now. Well, you're in the right place. Because God doesn't leave us alone. As a matter of fact, He gives us His Spirit. Here today, not one day, but here today. He gives us His Spirit to, to sing to the Lord a new song. And, and here in, in Psalm 149, it says, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Which is a curious thing because this is the, the, the hymn book of the early church. It's ancient Israel's hymn book as well. And there have already been 148 songs that they've sung. And you'd think 148 songs to sing to the Lord is enough. But there's always time for one more. There's always time to sing to the Lord one more song. One more song of praise. One more song of honor. One more song of thanks. 
Jesus knew what it was like to sing the, the, the ancient hymn book of Israel. As a matter of fact, Jesus quotes the Psalms more than any other book in the Bible. Again and again and again and again. And some of those times are places that you, you wouldn't expect at all on the cross. Jesus remembers the song, remembers the song from Psalm 22. And he cries out the words of verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, those who heard would have recognized that's a, that's, that's a hymn that the, that the, the people of Israel knew and knew well. And knew that it's just not a cry in despair. They knew that there's an answer to that. Yes, it's, it's, it's good, it's fine, it's right to ask God why. Yes, it's good, it's right to cry out to God. But they also knew that in verse 24, there in, in Psalm 22, verse 24, there's an answer to the question, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the answer is, he has not hidden his face. The answer is, when he cried for help, God heard. God heard. That now, today, it's the right time to sing to the Lord a new song. A new song. Because his strength is stronger than our fear. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. His strength is stronger than our fear. Bill Floyd, in his little book, Stories I Love to Tell, tells a story about Louis Armstrong when he was a boy. And the, the, the story comes under the, the heading of Fear Fouls the Pond. He says that when Louis Armstrong was a little boy, he was walking past this old woman's house, and the woman called out to him and said, Hey, Louis, why don't you take my bucket, take it down to the spring, and get me some water? Louis said, yes, ma'am. He, he went down to the pond, and as soon as he dipped the bucket in, two eyes popped up out of the spring. He ran back to the old woman. He said, Miss Allie Mae, Miss Allie Mae, there's an alligator in your spring. She laughed. She said, Louis, that old alligator's been there for years, and he's more afraid of you than you are of him. To which Louis Armstrong responded, well, if he's more afraid of me than I am of him, that water ain't fit to drink. Well, fear fouls the pond, but fear fouls a whole lot more things as well. Fear fouls all our relationships. It fouls the relationship among family. It fouls the relationship with friends. And fear fouls the relationship with God as well. Ernest Becker in his book, The Denial of Death, says, So many of our f the fears we grapple with, the fear of rejection, abandonment, Failure, separation, loss are but manifestations of the ultimate fear. The fear of death. Jesus doesn't leave us alone. Not now. And not in the face of, of our fear. Jesus tells you and me through, throughout Scripture that He's the Good Shepherd. And, and, and it had to, to, to point back to the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod... It was the rod that protected the sheep against the, the wolf, against the lion, against the bear. Thy rod and thy staff, it was the staff that rescued the sheep. When they had gone someplace that, that they shouldn't have gone, when all was doubtful, it was the good shepherd who had the rod. It's the good shepherd who has the staff. And they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. It's the, the oil that the, the good shepherd used to heal the sheep. 
for every injury the sheep had and that you and I have. We have a good shepherd who anoints us with oil. Our cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus is our good shepherd and that his strength is stronger than our fear. Yes, fear is real. But Jesus, the good shepherd, he has strength that you and I don't have. And his strength, his power, it's available to you today. His strength is stronger than our fear. And the second thing that I wanted to talk about this morning is that his forgiveness is stronger than our failure. You may know the name of Corrie ten Boom. She wrote a little book called The Hiding Place. And in this book, she talks about how during World War II that she and her family, that they were harboring Jews from the Nazis. They were betrayed by someone that they knew. And so the Nazis came and And not only hauled away those Jews that they were harboring, they hauled away their whole family. And they threw them in Ravensbrück concentration camp. During the war, Corey was the only one that survived because of a record-keeping error. After the war, she began going around to a war-torn Germany to let them know that through Jesus Christ, forgiveness was possible. She In the book, she talks about her struggle, her own struggle with forgiveness and being able to forgive those that betrayed her family, to forgive those that at their hands and others like like them killed her family. And she was talking to her pastor. Her pastor listened, and when she stopped, her pastor said, Corey, In the steeple, there's a bell. And that bell has a rope that hangs from it. And and every day I go out there and I, I pull that rope. And the bell begins to ring and ring and ring. And as long as I pull the rope, the bell continues to ring. And when I stop pulling the rope, he said the bell continues to ring for just a little while. A little more slowly. Until finally, the bell is silent. He goes on to tell her, he says, in order for you to forgive, you've got to let go of the rope. In order for you to forgive, you've got to let go of the rope. So often, we rehearse our own failure. We practice our own shortcomings. Or we practice our injury. We rehearse how others have betrayed or what others have done to us. That it was on the cross for you and for me that Jesus died to forgive all that's past. That it was on the cross that Jesus died to forgive you and me all that's present and all that would be. But the really great news is that he rose from the dead in order that he might live his life through you and me, that we might have power enough to receive that forgiveness, power enough where, we wouldn't, where we'd let go of the rope, where we wouldn't rehearse, we wouldn't practice our last failure. We wouldn't go over again the betrayal, that we really could let go of the rope and not rehearse what others have done day in and day out. David, he knew what it was like to hurt his own family. That in his episode with Bathsheba, he had caused injury, strife, so much so that one of his own sons wanted to kill him. David knew what it was like. And so he cries out to God in Psalm 139. Verse 23 and 24, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And if there's any wicked way in me, lead me to the everlasting way. Jesus is the way. 
Jesus is the truth. Jesus is, is life. Life. Jesus is the, the only way to, to have a life where forgiveness, forgiveness, his forgiveness is stronger than our failure. So we're called to sing out, to cry out to him that he may search us and that he may know us and he may give us the power we need to let go of the rope, to let go of the rope. His forgiveness, it's stronger than our failure. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, his joy is stronger than our sorrow. The Apostle Paul, he wrote more books of the Bible than anyone else. You can find those, those books, they were in letters, written to churches, written to individuals. They're, they're scattered throughout the, the end of, of the Bible. And in these letters, Paul knew that life wasn't just a theme park where, where one rides better than the one before. He knew what suffering was about. He'd been shipwrecked. Not only shipwrecked, he'd been beaten with rods. He'd not only been beaten with rods, he'd been beaten with whips within one stroke of death. Five times he'd been beaten with whips within one stroke of death. They threw rocks at him until they thought he was dead. They threw him over the wall, city wall, and left him for dead. And when he recovered, he continued to speak of the power of Jesus Christ. So they threw him in prison. In many of these letters, he wrote to people from prison in order to lift them up, in order to, to sing praise, to give thanks, to give strength to Christians. One of the strongest, most powerful of all the letters in the Bible is his letter to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 Paul is writing to them from prison. And what he says is, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Not just a, a little bit of the Spirit of God. Not hearing just the, the words of, 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 of Jesus sprinkled a little here and a little there. He says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. How? with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Paul, who knew suffering, who knew sorrow, knew that the joy of Jesus Christ is worth singing about. that it's worth giving praise, that his, his joy is greater than our sorrow. Several years ago, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And it's been a lot of years, several years, since she's known who I was or, or anyone else. And for a while there, on Fridays, I would go and I'd pick her up and we'd drive around in my car. She didn't know my name, but we would sing. We would sing together. She didn't know my name, but she knew the words to Amazing Grace. Because as a child, we, we sat in worship and we sang them together. She didn't know my name, but she knew the words to Blessed Assurance. But because together, I sat with my mom and I, I sang those words in, in worship. In worship on a day just like today. Well, it's been a while since mom has been able to, to sing those words, to remember those words. She could remember those words long, long after she could remember my name. But a couple of months ago. We needed to move mom into memory care. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you that that was like a kick in the stomach. Oh, that was hard. 
I can't name many things that were more difficult. But in prayer, I began to think, you know, if mom ha- had cancer or any other disease, we wouldn't have hesitated to, to take her to, to doctors, to folks, to nurses, to hospitals, to, to folks that could help her in ways that we couldn't. And that's what this memory care has been able to do. Well, they, they're able to give her stimulus around the clock that, well, that no family is large enough anywhere to be able to do. And in visiting with her, a couple of weeks ago, I sat there in her room. And I began to sing like we used to. Yes, in church and, and yes, in my car. And I began to sing there in her room, Amazing Grace. And she looked up and she smiled. And the Spirit of the risen Christ was there. Because His power, His joy is stronger than our sorrow. This morning, it may be that you're in that place and that life has sucked the song right out of you. You've got a new song. You and I have a new song to practice, to rehearse. It's a song of praise. It's a song of honor. It's a song of thanks. That Jesus Christ has power. The risen Christ has power in the, in the here and now. A power where the word of Christ will richly dwell in you and me. With all wisdom. And we can teach. We can admonish. We can lift up one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and sing. We can make melody with thanksgiving in our hearts to God when we don't have the power to do it. Pray with me. Jesus, we need your strength and you aren't hesitant to give it. You pour it out all around us. It's, 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 it's we that don't have the eyes to practice your strength and, and praise. It's we who, who don't have the, the power to practice your honor or thanksgiving. So often what we practice is our fear or our failure or our sorrow. Lord, this day, breathe on us the power of power of the risen Christ that the word and power your word and your power might dwell in us and we might know a strength your strength that's stronger than our fear that we might know your your forgiveness that's stronger than our failure and for this day We might know your joy, your joy that's stronger than our sorrow, and we might take that joy with us here this day and sing it all week long. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. 
Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.